Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our year-long series on municipal governments from across Canada, where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada to talk about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. We have touched uh, from the most eastern part of this country to the most western part of this country, and today we are going to the most southern part of this country, of Ontario, where we are going to be sitting down with Town of Amherstburg, Councillor Lyndon Crane. Councillor Crane, welcome to the show. Chris, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, uh, Lyndon, let's get the very first question I've asked every single politician on the show who's come in. Uh, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Lyndon? I think it probably dates back to high school volunteering for different fundraisers we had in, in uh, Amherstburg and also at the University of Windsor being on student senate. Uh, I was a representative for University of Windsor Students Alliance, which is a student union that represents all undergraduate students. So I was elected to that board position for two years and also got to serve uh, with the University of Windsor on their Senate with the president of the university. So um, that was my, I guess, um, first opportunity to be involved in um, service to my community at a board level. And I think that's what's got me hooked. You're a unique entity in itself in municipal politics, and not even that in politics in general. Uh, I, I will say that you are probably the youngest, if not the youngest, uh, sitting councillor in Canada today. There might be a few others that are a little bit younger than you, but you are the, the youngest that we've had on this show. Youth in politics is an interesting experience, and I want to talk about that about yourself as well. What made you, as a young man in your community, get involved in this last election when you were first elected? Great question. There wasn't necessarily a particular issue um, that I was advocating for that was perhaps near my neighborhood. Um, it was more of wanting to add a, a youthful voice to council. I think all different types of perspectives that we add to the council table bring so much value to the community and its residents. And that was really the, you know, what I think I, I brought to the table. Um, I do have other different experiences that I'm continuing to lean on being in, being in the, the uh, seat now, but uh, being a young person adds so much value. Like what, what experience do you have that you bring to the table? That's a different, unique perspective, because when we look at municipal councils, we, we try to bring that unique experience to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not a partisan politician. You are an independent person with your own unique views. So what unique views thought you would be the best person to fill that vacant uh, council position if elected mm -hmm. in 2022? Another great question. And I mean, other young people could have uh, definitely run. I think I think there was a few other young people that ran as well. Um, I think what set me out a, a bit more than than others, perhaps, was the involvement I already had in my community. This wasn't the first point where I, I wanted to get involved in Amherstburg. I was volunteering on a foundation, the Chamber of Commerce in our community. Um, I've helped raise, raise funds for various projects. So I was already in the weeds of things. And this was the next step that I, I thought I could take to provide more service to the community and um, that, I guess, was a differentiating factor for me. I also uh, worked in the mayor's office at the city of Windsor. Uh, I had some board governance experience that I mentioned uh, at the university and, and various committees in the community. So I really tried to lean on that. Um, but, you know, work experience, probably minimal. minimal. Uh, I'm a mortgage agent now, so I, I'm really in a full-time role for the first time right now. I mean, there's there's always summer jobs where you're in a full-time position, but uh, right now is the kickoff of of my career if you if you look at it that way. So uh, you, you say that you you were active in your community, you volunteered a lot, you were active in municipal politics in the city of uh, Windsor's mayor's office. I want to go back to uh, last year's election, and I want to ask this question because I always find it fascinating to hear the different perspectives. When you were out door knocking, when you were out knocking on doors and uh, approaching people to garner their vote, 
were there issues that were people were bringing to you that you didn't think were issues? And when you heard them, you said, wow, I'm very glad that someone's brought this to my attention because if I don't talk to my constituents, then they're not going to, I'm not going to be a good effective counselor in addressing those issues. For sure. Uh, to think of the top of my head, um, I might have to get back to you on that unless something comes to me right now, but there's, there's always minute issues or different things that you wouldn't even thought of, uh, Going were there, were there, area. were there more municipal issues? Because I've spoken to many counselors from across Canada, and the the one thing I find interesting, especially with municipal counselors, is their constituents will talk to them about other levels of government issues, whether it be healthcare, whether it be education. Mm -hmm. Did did that come up in your election? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would. I would reach doors, and uh, they would be asking me about my my vaccination status. And uh, they they bring up education issues, healthcare stuff like that. Uh, but most residents, I think, understood what our um, what you know what council in Amherstburg had direct oversight of. And uh, if if they did bring up those types of issues, I would make sure to address it. Uh, but now that I think of it, there's actually um, I think a resident mentioned to me um, about the self checkouts at uh, like shoppers or or whatever type of grocery store um, and how that's taking away jobs and that necessarily wasn't something that I had power over or we could make a council decision and, and say to this this uh, business owner hey no more self checkouts you're, you're taking away a bunch of jobs so um, little things like that that I that I tried my best to make sure I was educating people on um, and so they knew that if you were to contact me I would just be redirecting you to somebody. So education was huge when I was knocking on the door. So let's talk about election night, because that's always a fun night. As someone who ran mm -hmm. for municipal politics back in Ontario in the municipality of Clarington, I, I, I still remember that first time walking into the ballot box and seeing my name and then putting an X beside it or a check mark. Or if you have electronic voting now, you phoned in or you emailed in a check mark. For you, what was that experience like for voting for yourself? Awesome. I mean, <laughs> it was a great feeling to see. <laughs> it was good to see my name on the ballot for sure. I made I made it a goal of mine to actually vote for myself on election day. I don't know if that was just a superstition know, or thought I had in my mind. <laughs> yeah, superstition, right? If I had voted on election day, my my chances would be greater. But no, I it was it was a rewarding feeling just just knowing that my name was on there and that I, I followed all of the rules to be nominated and a candidate. Um, it's it's a privilege that we have living in Canada, and it was it was it was an extremely rewarding experience for me. And what about election night? Because the the wait is always the most anticipating part of the whole election cycle is waiting to know if you've gotten enough votes to actually make it on council. For you, when that announcement came out that Lyndon Crane is the next town councillor elect for the town of Amherstburg, Ontario, what was that moment like for yourself? Was there a, a, a moment of, oh, no, what have I gotten myself into? Or was it more of a joy? It was, it was a joy and relief. <laughs> Actually, that day, I don't think I ate any food. I was so <laughs> nervous. Uh, I lost my appetite. But uh, with with municipal elections it's so hard to predict whether you're going to win the data is just not there so leading up to election night i was i don't know my mind was racing i i felt confident one minute the next i felt like i was going to lose this thing but it was a great experience being around uh, my family and friends at a at a local restaurant my brother was actually at the polling station and collected the results with the other candidates so i could then relay that to everybody at at the restaurant and it was it was an amazing experience i mean he facetimed me and was was showing me the screen of the tv with all of the election results as they came in live and i was i couldn't see anything all that my my name was was highlighted in yellow that was the only thing i could see which meant i i won i hung up the phone and he drove over but realizing after the fact that i won and then also got the most votes out of every single position uh, I was just mind blown because I, I went into that thing not knowing 
what was going to happen, whether it was going to get in fifth, first, in between. You just don't know. So how many, so uh, the town is elected at a, at large uh, system, right? It's not ward systems because I know some cities are, but the town of Amherstburg is not a, a, a ward system, correct? It's at large. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Now this is the fun part of the interview that I get to go into a little bit here because you're elected. The mo- the, the happiness is there. But now the real work gets underway. The real work gets underway and you walk into the town council chambers for the very first time as a councillor elect. How mm-hmm. much of a responsibility and weight do you put on your shoulders to be, be prepared for every single council meeting that you attend? Because the decisions you vote on, the decisions you now make are going to affect your life your neighbor's lives, your family's lives, your community's lives, and it's going to affect their pocketbooks as well. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? Huge amount of responsibility. I, I, I want to make sure that every meeting I go to, I'm prepared, that I read the agenda front to back, you know, just skim through it, uh, because we're dealing with a $52 million budget, and we're dealing with 23,000 residents who all have families and uh, expenses they need to to keep up in a budget, right? So uh, I, I don't take that lightly. And I know that every single decision that I make has a direct impact on someone's life and being in a municipal government, um, it ha- probably has the most direct impact compared to other levels. So um, it's it's not something that I just would read the night before for a couple hours. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm ready. I'll, I'll hear what everyone else has to say in the meeting. No, I'm, I'm ready there. I have questions written down. I've highlighted things and I'm ready to go. Okay, you bring up a good point there because you want to be prepared, but you also want to leave some openness for a potential change of mind, right? Because you can't go in assuming that you're going to vote one way and not hear anyone else out. So Mm -hmm. when you're looking at your council reports, is there a moment when you have to say, okay, I do have questions and I can't go into this meeting thinking I'm going to vote this way no matter what I hear from that answer for the question that I have? Mm-hmm. No, and I always have in the back of my mind, hey, this is this is what I think uh, we should do. But I, I hold off from from sharing that opinion right off the bat. Like when it comes to voting on a certain uh, item, I'm not just raising my hand. Okay, let's let's move in and second it and, and vote it through. I like the discussion. I think that's why we have council meetings in the first place. I want to hear everyone else's perspective around the table because. My, my, you know, my, di- my opinion on something could easily change based on, on what else, you know, somebody else says. So um, I, I, I'm very cognizant of that. And I want to make sure that I hear all opinions before I just I jump to the gun. And the very first meeting that I attended as a, as a council member, uh, I didn't talk too much. I was just listening because I'm new. I, you know, I had five hours of experience. I, I wanted to make sure that um, I wasn't going into the meeting thinking I knew everything and this is the way to go. I have to learn from the other people that have been around the table as well. You're coming up to your, if not past by the time this airs, your first hundred days in office. How, how much of an education, you just smiled there for those who are listening to this <laughs> in uh, by, by audio, but how much of a learning curve has this job been for you? Because I can imagine what you expect it and what it is are two different things. So how much of a learning curve did you have to go through in your first hundred days in office? I I wouldn't, there's, there's things I learned. I, I don't know necessarily think it was a steep learning curve for me, just working at the city. I understood a little bit about what I was getting into and what the constituency work was like. Um, but you know, there's, 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 I think some things that I've, I've learned along the way, and um, a lot of uh, understanding how planning works, and a lot of the b- behind the scene things that take place before it appears at council, um, and and the red tape that you might have to go through in order to get something done. That I, I think I learned a lot, uh, but I've, I've way more to absorb, and I've been trying to take advantage of every type of educational training that there is like through AMO, I, I attended their new counselor training. I went to Roma. So I'm, I'm going in with trying to get my, my feet wet as much as I can, because uh, that's, that's how you learn is, is by taking on so many opportunities in this position. Has there been any surprises to the job though? 
yes, I, I can't please everyone. And I, some things are just out of my control. Um, Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Okay, because that it's a question I want to ask a little bit later. So we're going to jump into segment two here, and that is the town of mm. Amherstburg itself. And before I start this, I want to preface this because we always get emails from people who listen to these interviews. This is the councillor's opinion. This is not a motion at mm -hmm. council. This is not a priority of council. This is his opinion. And I say that mm -hmm. because... I want people to differentiate what's said in council and what's voted on council and what we're talking about here today. So, councillor, sure. in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing your municipality today? There's a number, but I think what sets the foundation for completing the other issues that we might have is our finances. Um, I'd like to see a, a considerable amount in reserves that we know we can take on these capital projects and we don't have to issue new debt. I think that's every municipality's dream um, is not having to take on a debenture and, and making sure that we can pay for everything that we want done. Obviously in a timely manner, we don't want to blow through our reserves in one year to, to make Amherstburg great in a second, but uh, our finances are important. So I, I'd like to see us continue to build up our reserves so we can afford to have those nice things that people want in the community uh, like parks and you know some have mentioned they want to see a pool um, some would like more bike lanes I don't know there's there's so many different wish list items but it comes down to our finances and what's in our what's in our budget so how do we do that how do you as a counselor do that because I believe that you and I would both agree right now things are tough out there cost mm -hmm. of living is going up inflation is going up the cost of doing business is going up so you are looking, and we're not going to talk about the budget because I know your budget is not being presented by the time we are recording this, mm -hmm. but you're looking at a situation where you want to try and save for the future, but you also don't want to put that on the backs of the people that are in your community today. So how do you see yourself leading that conversation to put some money, more money into the reserves, but also at the same time, spending on the issues that need to be spent on today? Yes. So one, obviously we can, we can look at getting some grant relief and some funding relief through, through upper levels of government. I think we always have to look for that for sure. Um, but also when um, our, you know, we, perhaps there's a tax increase that comes into play and um, we need to make sure that let's say we increase the taxes. Could we look at, you know, if we're trying to decrease the uh, tax rate, could we set aside a, a, a portion that we're, we're uh, finding efficiencies for? Could we put that into reserves? Um, that's that's a, a big portion of it, right? If, if taxes are going up, can we put a, a portion of that into reserves and, and keep it there? Um, those are just some of the things that I can think of, but also just watching our, our, our spending and understanding needs versus wants is extremely important. So everything, you know, there's a lot of items that are on the wish list that we'd like to get done, but we have to prioritize it through our five-year capital plan and get it done in, in, a, in a timely manner and making sure that um, we can afford what we're about to, to uh, construct. You talk about the needs and wants of your community, and it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, statement that you made there because... 
if I go talk to a hundred people in your community today, they will all have their own needs and wants. And you, you mm-hmm. mentioned it a little bit beforehand about how you can't please everyone. Now you're about to sit down and do a budget and you're going to have to pick the winners and losers of your community. The people who may not get exactly what they want and some people who may get what they want, whether it be a new upgrade to a park or a new uh, sidewalk pavement. How do you balance the needs of your community against the needs of the one individual? Because you're there to be representing everyone in your community not just one person or one street Mm -hmm. you're there to represent everyone so how do you see yourself trying to balance that scenario where you have to move the town forward but you also can't forget about the people who make up the town yes so i every idea that's brought forward to me i always look at okay yes it's a good idea who will it impact how many will it impact and uh, I guess, yeah, those are the, some factors that I look at. And, you know, if if it's not just serving one individual, and obviously there there are issues where you do need to just assist one individual because yeah. that there might be a problem that's, that is d- uh, directly impacting their life. It's something the municipality can easily fix. But you have to look at big picture. And how, how do you look at the big picture in a community like yours? Because... I'm assuming you can't go to the grocery store or to the post office without people stopping you and saying, Hey, I have, I have an idea that I need you to bring up to council and talk about this. How do you balance the big picture in a community like yours? Because you are the front line and you are the ones that are making the decisions and they will tell you their opinions on certain issues. If you vote in favor or against it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a tough thing. Uh, I'm still learning how to do it. But I, when I, when it comes time to, to uh, complete budget deliberations, I'm going to look, we have to prioritize <laughs> Go, something as simple as ranking, ranking the items from, from one to five or one to 10. This is a, this is a must. Um, that's how I, I, I think I'm going to strategize it and make sure that um, things that are extremely essential, um, that if we do not invest in that, this is the fallout is how I, how I'll look at it. You, you seem like a very educated man. You seem like someone who knows the, the pulse of their community. Um, as I said beforehand, you, you talk about some of the issues that are coming up, especially the financial issue. Um, mm-hmm. Again, this is your opinion and your opinion only. Mm-hmm. Um, how is it you, a young man, and I know this is going to sound like a very rude question to ask here, but I think you already know what the question is going to be. How do you <laughs> oh, yeah. tell the people of your community, I know what's best for our community? And I'm not trying to be rude there. I'm just trying to I'm, no, I'm just trying to get no. I'm trying to get to the, the crux of how does a man like yourself say to the, your community, I know what's best. And I believe that my vision for how the budget should be presented, how the budget should be spent is the best one for our community with as much experience in life as you have. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, I I don't know what's best. That's why it's important to consult with the community, right? That's, that's why I I go to our public open houses and I have conversations with people on social media and I call them and I email them because I want to understand what the pulse is. Um, I have general ideas of where I think we should go, but I, I don't know hundred percent if this is the, the right call. That's why I, I want to consult with people first and they appreciate that. But you, you brought up a good point. And when I was running for office, I ran into um, some concerns that I still live with my parents. I don't pay taxes, um, all really? that type of stuff. How, right. Right. You know what I mean? Like I don't pay, I don't pay taxes. So how do I know uh, what's in the best interest of residents? But whether I was paying taxes or not, it's I, I'm focused on what's in the best interest for the entire community and your taxes, not necessarily what's what's going to bring more money into my pocket. Um, if I looked at that, it, it, I'd be very selfish. So um, it's what's going to be in the best interest for the entire community. And if I can be in a position where um, I have great communication skills and can gather a consensus of this is where we need to go, then that's that's why I was elected. Um, to be a communicator, to to gather all of the ideas, bring it to the council to sit, table, and make an educated educated decision. 
I, I don't go in there knowing that um, this is the right way without consulting with people. You mentioned the key word there that I love, and that's communications. Communication is very mm -hmm. key. I know you're very active on social media, um, but social media is not where everyone is. It's where a very mm -hmm. small vocal majority or minority is. How do you engage with your entire community? Because when I asked you that question yes. about districts and wards, how do you engage everyone and not just the people that are in the echo chamber that is your social media followers? Exactly. Now well, that's that's a really good point, and um, the the majority of it is attending our, our public open houses on certain topics, whether it's for Warren Mickle Park, short term rental regulations, um, any type of public open house that we have. I'm there, and I'm I'm there for the full time, listening to residents as they write down their comments on a piece of paper, or relaying it to staff. <laughs> that's that's a great opportunity. Also attending events. Uh, that's extremely important because you you meet people and ideas spark when they see you and they're, they're looking for action and they're looking for looking for your help um, if I was at home I, I I wouldn't been you know be able to really take action on those items understand what the community issues are so I try to get out there as much as I can and we also have surveys so council will review the survey results when they're sent out and people can write it on on paper and mail it in they can go to the libro they can fill it out online, uh, but you're right. It's, it's hard to consult with everyone, but um, if you can have a great sample size and hear from as many residents as, as you physically can, um, then I think I'm doing, you know, the right steps to consult with everybody. Is your community engaged? Are you, or is your community members willing to give the feedback that you're looking for? Absolutely. I think because we have a small community, we, you know, word spreads, you know what I mean? So uh, we have a local newspaper and uh, when, when issues happen, everyone finds out. Which is always good. Now I am very cautious of time here and we've been chatting for a half hour and I want to turn to my last segment now and the counselor, and that is my favorite segment and that's tourism. I love tourism. I love being a tourist. I love going to communities. I've made a pledge that if you come on my show, I will be in your community this summer. So get ready for the cross border oh, awesome. interview to, to be in the town of Amherstburg later on this year. So counselor, in your opinion, but not really your opinion, if you a tourist was coming to your community tomorrow, mm -hmm. what are some of the hidden gems that they should be doing? How, how long do we have? <laughs> Hey, I've got 48 <laughs> hours that you have me in the town of Amherstburg. So you give me a 48 hour rundown of the things I need to do and I will be there and doing them. Okay. I'll try to go quick. Uh, you're going to want to see Fort Malden historical site. Uh, fantastic uh, place that, you know, dates back to the war of 1812. There's the Amherstburg free museum. And there's a church that's connected to it that uh, I believe in, 2048 will probably be about 200 years old. Um, there's Holiday Beach, which is uh, a beach and, and campground and conservation area. There's so many great trails around around Amherstburg. You're definitely going to want to check out some great restaurants. Ricardo's is a classic, excellent pasta. Um, you got Salty Dog, Pepper Cat across the street. There's the River Bookshop, uh, which has a great selection of books, local events. Uh, popcorn shop, candy store, so many little retail spaces that you can visit. And uh, of course, you have to visit the Navy Yard Park and view the waterfront. You can look over to Boblo Island. Um, there are so many great spots. And if you only have 48 hours, I'd suggest staying a few more days because you won't be able to hit it all. But I think our community has so much character. And that's what you'll you'll notice when you come in the summertime is just the character, the history, uh, you know, just the, the nice people that we have in Amherstburg. Um, it, it'll feel like home to you. And uh, that's why I'm proud to live in Amherstburg, just because of of the great culture that we do have. So you mentioned about three things that like literally perked my interest. Um, did you say a free museum, like as an F R E E free museum, or is it just oh, the name free free museum? <laughs> <laughs> Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Oh, freedom. I was like, wait, there's a free museum in Canada and I have not <laughs> been there yet? Where? What is this all about? Okay. Um, yeah. So, but for you though, after a stressful day, after a long mm -hmm. day at council, after a long day of doing events, 
Where do you go in your community to decompress? Is there a park? Is there a literally a hidden gem? And before I say this, I've said this to every counselor. You can't say your own house. You can't say your own room. You have to say somewhere in your community. And yes, you have to pick and choose uh, a favorite spot. I honestly probably go for walks near my house. But um, if I had to pick, we're probably out downtown walking somewhere. We just like to walk summertime, grab an ice cream from New Chelly's or water for an ice cream. Um, and just just enjoy the scenery because it's it's really unmatched in, in Windsor, Essex. Now, my uh, last question for you, counselor, is this. Um, and take as long as you want to answer this question as you wish. But what makes the town of Amherstburg such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think uh, compared to the rest of Ontario, housing prices, for sure. Uh, we have great educational institutions in Amherstburg. There's a brand new high school. There's a French school. There's a public school, a Catholic school. Uh, there's so many educational institutions, um, some that I didn't even, even name. Um, but there's that, there's great amenities, new skate park that just got built, uh, state-of-the-art Libro Center with uh, dual ice pads and so much more. Um, there's a great selection of, of jobs, especially with those retail spots that I, that I mentioned. Um, there's, there's a lot to offer. There's a great history in Amherstburg if you're just looking to, to live and, and soak it up. Um, Waterfront. <laughs> I, I don't think you'll you'll have another place in Windsor. I mean, Windsor has a a, a large waterfront as well, but Amherstburg has a, a great navy yard park that you can walk along. And um, in the summertime, the the flower arrangements and the gardens are just beautiful. So um, the the architecture is another one, especially downtown buildings being two hundred years old or more. Um, it's you, I don't know. You you feel like you're in a different world when you're when you're down there, and the, the murals as well. I mean, there's been in the past couple of years, there's been dozens of murals. I don't know if there's dozens, but there's been at least a dozen murals that have been uh, painted on on different buildings, and uh, it's just it's just a great sight to see. Um, there's so much more I could I could talk about, but I'll leave it at that. You are the first counselor or elected official who's been on this series who has not let off with the people. And I appreciate that because that is the most canned answer I always get is the people are always great. And I'm like, oh, this guy actually is talking about his community. So I appreciate that. Um, but the people don't get me wrong. The people are great as well. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Crane, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down with me and chatting about yourself and your community. Um, like I said, I'm looking forward to visiting Amherstburg. Am Amherstburg. Wow, I will get it right when I'm visiting uh, later on this year. Um, but thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor to chat with you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And when you're in Amherstburg, let me know. We'll, we'll make sure you can have a tour of Town Hall and I'll, I'll, I'd love to bring you around town. Awesome. So with that, um, tomorrow we are back for another great episode of the cross board interviews and we're heading uh, up to Northern Ontario to the city of Timmins to sit down with their mayor tomorrow. So please tune in for that great episode. So with that, I want to remind everyone, get off social media for at least five minutes, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone keep talking. Mm -hmm.